The bird 935, closing with a localizer, eight miles to go. Position yourself and advise established. 935, we'll call. 935, roger, six miles to go. Call the tower on 1181. The Atlantic Alliance binds together 15 nations in the cause of common defense. Cooperation in mutual security, cooperation too in any endeavor which can forward the common good of 15 friends and neighbors. Such are the pledges of NATO. Airspace, its uppermost limits as high as man can fly, the new ocean of the 20th century navigators. Each year finds further expansion in the conquest of the sky, fresh victories in the endless battle against space and time. A science bewildering in its complexity, of dreams so fast turning into realities that few possess the sophistication needed to accept them without awe. The science that by its very nature demands the utmost in international cooperation, so that all who take wing can enjoy the maximum freedom of the air. Such are the times in which we live that cooperation seems most advanced in the field of mutual defense. At an air display in the United States, Pilots of several NATO nations prepare for a joint performance before expectant crowds. And so they slide past, the giants of the US Strategic Air Command. Following them, the huge white shapes of Britain's long-range heavies, their vast bulks making their speed appear deceptively slow. Then the darted fighters, their roars and whip cracks making the timid flinch. International cooperation in the air. But this is not the only kind of flying. The other kind enables anyone with the price of a ticket to move across our globe at a speed that few of our ancestors could have envisaged. Yours today to look down on Sydney, Melbourne, Montreal, Frankfurt or Cairo. Yours today to look down on Rome, Copenhagen, Brussels, London or Paris. For man, Powered flight is an experience but a bare 60 years old. Yet in all its young life, civil aviation has known no more rapid advancement than that of these last post-war years. Orly, Idlewild, Schiphol, London, and many others. These are the giant termini of a traffic that is expanding so rapidly as to make any airport outgrown in a decade. For the civil pilots, theirs is a profession vastly different from that of their service counterparts. In the world of the air, they are the liner crews. Calm, reliable, careful to the extreme, which is just as it should be, for in their hands they hold the lives of thousands. Thus, for those thousands, flying has become as commonplace as taking a bus. But unlike bus lines, aviation has advanced at such a pace since the war that speeds and schedules have changed almost before the ink of timetables has dried. This civil air world has always called for the utmost in international cooperation. To keep in step, guiding and coordinating, organization and traffic management and safety control have had to develop equally fast. Flights, and yet more flights, each toy a plane in the skies, each chalked figure another shipment of human lives. As the air has filled above our world, ingenuity has been hard pressed to cut down the elements of chance and the possibilities of human error. The pupil controllers of today's air traffic have indeed much to learn.
a science within a science, and one equally bewildering in its complexity. Training to become backroom boys indeed, for seldom will the flying public catch a glimpse of them. Yet without them, the weight of traffic now flying would be impossible. Learning the intricacies of such processes as stacking, the system by which incoming planes queue up to descend to the runways, which can only receive them in their proper turn. Becoming familiar with those invisible paths over land and sea which are the airways, their curbs and milestones marked by the dots and dashes of the beacons. Invisible, yet always there. Control on service to all those unlawful business in the air. This is Scandinavian sugar easy baker bakery. Could you read over? Now a hypothetical case. Hypothetical. Yet the kind of thing that has been known to happen even in the seemingly limitless space of the skies. First the liner. On time, on the beam. Second, somewhere too up there in the blue, a jet Air Force trainer, its young pilot not merely indulging in an exhibition of joie de vivre, but dutifully practicing the kind of maneuver that will one day make him into a first-class fighter pilot. He checks his position, for his legal airspace too is limited. Has he made a mistake? At all events, he decides on a few more loops and rolls before returning to base. For the liner passengers, an unexpected, unexplained bump. For their pilot, a report to be made. The report of what is technically known as an air miss. And so, as the passengers of Flight X, who have already accepted and forgotten, proceed on their normal way, the wires below begin to hum. Side by side with the civilian controller is his Air Force counterpart. And for him, immediate action. Within the communication network of the service, telephone calls, messages, signals. Investigation, identification, resulting finally in inquiry. Questions asked of the trainee serviceman. Questions, too, asked of the civil pilot. Patiently, the reasons why are sought, so that this kind of incident might never happen again. For only by full cooperation between all who use the air can order and safety rule in its vastnesses. Those vastnesses that we once thought so limitless and so empty. Paris, location of the Palais Dauphine, headquarters of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. NATO's main business is with matters of defense, but as the common good of its member nations is as much a part of security as any armament, NATO's activities today have wider scope. Among the committees that convene regularly is that of European Airspace Coordination, SEAC, a body whose job it is to deal with the problems of Europe's crowded air. The NATO committee of SEAC was set up when the expansion of both civil and military traffic over Europe threatened really dangerous congestion. It is a meeting ground between the civil aviation authorities of NATO nations and their military counterparts, as well as key representatives from NATO commands. Its job is to promote safety and economy while keeping the maximum freedom for the training of NATO's air forces. SEAC's most important work has been the coordination of airspace needed during NATO air exercises. These may involve as many as 5,000 sorties per day in small and highly congested areas of Europe. If these NATO activities meant interference with the civil airlines, then SEAC had to work out a compromise. For both sides, reasonable give and take. 
the civil air world had already formed its own cooperative bodies. The International Civil Aviation Organization and the International Air Transport Association. But as SEAC basically deals with national civil and military bodies as well as NATO, these two organizations just sit in as observers. Though their technical advice is, of course, very valuable indeed. To meet the threat of lightning attack, defending fighters must be able to take off in emergency and roar up to battle altitude without hindrance. And battle altitude today is somewhere way up. To fit in such needs with airline operation, SEAC has already achieved much and put it into practice. Day by day, the complex jigsaw of airliners and battle planes over Europe gives an overall picture of efficiency and the minimum of delays. But now, as new civil jets take to the air, the airlines demand space in the upper, more rarefied air that once belonged purely to the military. Tests have shown that a jet traveling at 560 miles an hour will continue on its path for more than a mile before responding to its controls. Two aircraft approaching head-on with 10 miles visibility would see each other only about 35 seconds before collision. Under these conditions, the long-term task of SEAC must be to plan for still closer coordination between the civil and the military in their control of air traffic. The equipment, radar and other devices needed to maintain the finer, closer control of the future will be enormously expensive. SEAC seeks to promote joint civil-military use of such equipment, so making things easier for everybody. United States Air Force personnel inspect a model of a new kind of night landing equipment. Its flashing lights are designed to give the descending pilot, landing under bad conditions, a better, surer means of controlling his approach. And what the military test and perfect today may be just the thing for the civil airways tomorrow. Cooperation, give and take, by the men of the air, whether working alone or together through NATO. For the airspace is the new ocean of the 20th century, and all who use it must be safeguarded. Their right is the right to guidance, guidance and control, sure and comforting. Lose altitude now at the rate of 500 feet per minute. You are two and a half miles from touchdown. Check your undercarriage and flaps for landing. Your heading of 280 is quite okay. Turn left left now, three degrees. On the center line, on the glide path. A mile and a quarter from touchdown. You are on the center line, steady on the glide path, 400 yards from the threshold. Guidance and control, sure and comforting.